today about talking to the media and and why it's necessary, and then really drill down into some some techniques. And this is just in way of biography, a little bit about us. Um, I have a degree in journalism and um, a master's in I don't know what you want to call it. It's sort of a liberal arts thing, but I I am a trained social media strategist. I've been a um, you have guys a lot of you have lead Maryland. I'm a lead. Delaware class fellow, and then for anything to do with really for agriculture, I turn to my my colleague or partner in crime, Tracy. <laughs> yeah, and I'm I'm a um, farm girl. I grew up on a farm, um, and I always like to say in my presentations, I was crazy enough to marry a farmer. <laughs> but um, no, I love. I've been an extension. It'll be 31 years October 1st, and um, but I've loved it. I love um, sharing with people. But I do have my bass. Uh, bachelor's and master's in plant science um, and do a lot with the green industry now, but did 13 years of vegetable research and, and education with our state vegetable specialist. So Michelle and I work well together. We on do. Those we do. And we're going to really quickly, the first part, talk about the issues in agriculture communications. And essentially, we have, it, we have issues because there's a lot of mis, uh, miscommunication, misunderstanding about, about how food is produced. And then uh, to respond to that, learning how to use value-based communications, which is something that farmers, at least in my, my experience, haven't been using very well. And uh, I've gotten this training from the Center for Food Integrity. Uh, they are a, a, basically that's what they teach, how, how we can communicate more effectively. They actually have something called the Engaged Training, which is an offshoot. Um, very similar to the Ag Animal Ag Alliance and the Farmers and uh, Ranchers Association. They're, they're along that line. Um, then we're going to learn some techniques that you can use through um, at, with an interviewer who's working for print or broadcast media and how to directly engage with the public and, some, and practicing some techniques. So when I think about people in agriculture, this is what comes to mind, the local family farmers, the niche specialty crops, the garden centers, the poultry farmers. These are these are you. This is this is who I've met and how I feel. This is what I this is the producers. This is our clientele. Um, but if you ask the public, these large words are the most commonly uh, word associations that come when you say what what is farming? And this comes from watching films like Food Inc. and watching some Chipotle commercials, not dissing them as a business, but, but that's that's the image that they've created for agriculture. And if you're on social media, you see a lot of this. You see a lot of this. We'll show some examples. So, um, and for and, those of us that from the farm angle, you know, the, we don't always associate with those words, and we're wondering where they're coming from. So right. it's always and so. That's why I love doing this with Michelle because um, you have to have a conversation, you have to engage. So it's important to know where both sides and or what's out there. So right, speak. right. And if we had more time, we could really show you some examples. I mentioned um, Oprah. Oprah did a um, a week long program a few years back called Going Vegan. She challenged her audience and her staff to go vegan for the week, mm -hmm. and all week long she had Michael Pollan who is a, I would say, not a friendly voice for production agriculture. And, and you know, they, they promote vegetarian and, and veganism. And so th there is, it was a lopsided presentation, but Cargill did come in and did a really fine job. These activists are, are very engaged. They are very passionate and very motivated. And they use every tool at their disposal. And I find that farmers sometimes, you know, they work the earth, they're down to earth, and they don't like social media networking. They prefer to walk up to you and held out their hand and how do you do? I, I want to meet you in person. They may use social media, maybe use Facebook, but they really don't like the digital world as much. Um, and so, th therefore, they're not on the same platforms where all this is going on. And so they're not even aware sometimes, as Tracy, you can be very surprised that this is – the prevailing view now of agriculture. And so we desperately need you to tell your stories. 
and that means doing it yourself on social media, but also in how you talk to the media. And these are kind of the screenshots of, of how they depict agriculture. And I, I have yet to have seen any farmer dress up in a hazmat suit uh, when they're harvesting or when they're brooding, but this is what they show. Or they, stick needles and things. They love to, they <laughs> love to use hypodermic needles. And rightly so, you know, if uh, one thing I have to say is the industry, um, they have been, they've pushed, they've insisted on um, proper treatment of animals, and we should all be for that, mm -hmm. and I think we are, we're all moving in that direction. Everybody wants their, their livestock and their poultry to be, to be healthy while they're in our care. So, um, but this is a, for instance, this is a map of, uh, it's called factory farmmap.org, and usually .orgs are, quote, more trusted. It's just showing our area, the Demarfa Peninsula, as being, you know, danger, extreme, ground zero for factory farming. So this is the perception that is out there. So it's not surprising that when the media comes knocking at your door, you might be a little defensive, and you might be thinking, are, are these people out to attack me? Are they, are they going to do a number on me or a piece on me that, that's going to get it all wrong? And so I have found that farmers are mistrustful of media because they don't know, you don't know what angle they're coming from. But um, the people who are vegans or people who eat raw food um, or plant-based, they're not our enemy. This is all agriculture, right, Tracy? Yeah, we support all ag. We support all ag. There may be legitimate health reasons. reasons. Yeah. Doctor might prescribe. I know Bill Clinton, for instance, after his bypass, went on a plant-based diet. You may be a different religion where you don't eat meat. So you may have an allergy to a certain food and can't eat it. You right, don't know. Right. Yeah. There's mosquitoes now that if they bite you a certain yeah, day, you develop can a change the way you eat. Yeah. So my my what my response is is hey, it's all good. Um, I think any way you want. We have many choices for many voices, and that's the beauty of agriculture. Just we try not to bash another. So uh, tradition, traditional media. This would be your WBOC, your NBC, ABC, CBS, Fox affiliates, and your newspapers. They're trying to reflect um, stories that their demographic wants to know about, or public concern, or an issue about um, that's in the public health. There may be a Viral videos, when something goes viral now on social media, it makes the news. And um, so that this is what they're reflecting, what, the, what they think their public wants to hear about. Um, this is just an interesting way of how social media is done. This is going back to 2014. But this was Huffington Post, which is a liberal-based um, news service did an actually legitimate article talking about why poultry has gotten larger over the years. And it was very, actually I was very surprised, it was very factual. It talked to, that the reason behind this change in the physiology is because of selective breeding and improved nutrition. But when it went out on social media, the social media person prefaced that picture by saying, kind of horrifying, huh? And as a result, you had a lot of people chiming in saying how terrible poultry production is, and there's no way I would eat it. And this is a comment from somebody just saying, you know, I can absolutely vouch that, that um, antibiotics and steroids are used. And you can talk to your blue in the face on social media. You're not, you're not going to reach people. So um, we have to become engaged with people in a respectful way. If I call somebody, oh, you're an idiot, you're a jerk, you're ill-informed, I've shut them down. They're never going to want to listen to me. So we we need to be able to understand where the where the audience is coming from. That they've come through a certain process to get the information that they've had, and now we need to um, try and connect with them, and rather than just bark back at them that they're wrong. Mm -hmm. And so the way you do that is through value based communication. And what is that? Um, well, this this is just a, a this yeah. is an old clip, and I, I think it this. was funny. <laughs> Usually at Thanksgiving, people get around the table and they start, you know, if you bring up politics or you're, you're bringing your new girlfriend home or a significant other to meet your family, and they have views different than what your parents or grandparents have, and all hell can break loose. 
and religion and politics definitely. But now agriculture, Tracy. Oh, yeah, very much so. Agriculture can be a hot topic. <laughs> At least that's what we're seeing. So what is value-based communication? Um, you may have seen this before. This is the Center for Food Integrity uh, slide. But when farmers talk about what they do, they usually talk about it in terms of their economics. I had X number of bushels of yield of this or um, my profits. They, and they'll do this because they talk to trade publications and they talk amongst each other in these economic terms. Um, University of Delaware might talk about data and science and uh, results and studies and research. And so these are usually how agriculture is talked about. But what the consumer wants to know is, Tracy, are, are, do you have, do you care about the animals that you grow on your farm? Do you care about the environment? Yes. And as a person who lives it every day, um, I'm here to say from the other side, many of us get very offended that someone thinks differently than that. Just because we are living it, it is a passion for us. So it is, but it is, it's important for us in the industry to realize that we're, you know, the other person is passionate, we're just as passionate, but we have to find that common ground. And this is where the, the values come in to the even values. start a conversation. We should never lead with money and how much of a hit you've taken or uh, how much profits. We want farming to be profitable, don't get me wrong. But when you're talking to the public, you must lead with your values. This is all about... I don't care how much you know what I care about. I care that you, I that you have care. To, that you care. And yeah. so when they're meeting you for the first time in print on a 30 second spot on a camera, that's, you're only going to have a short amount of time to be able to tell that person that you are a responsible grower. You are a responsible custodian of the animals that you have on your farm that you have, so this is where you want to bring in that you're part of a farm family, that there's, there's a tradition of generations that's been handed down, and that this land is something that you value, that you respect, and that you have a value system, and that's what you have to lead with. And when any comment that you make to the media, you've got to work that in right up front. And think about, I mean, a prime example is my um, niece lives in Fairfax County, Virginia. She grew up in a very urban setting. She was sitting in my kitchen looking out my um, back door at our field, and she asked, she said, Aunt Tracy, does Uncle Jeff use pesticides? And I said, yes, he does when he has to. But we eat the food that he produces, so we would never do anything intentionally to hurt someone. We care, too, because we're, we're eating it as well. And so you could see that just set that tone and she was mm -hmm. satisfied and that kind of thing. So it is so important how you start the conversation. Absolutely. And we can talk about, oh, extension says this is safe and the research says this is the, the best variety and so forth and so on. But leading off with shared values, if you can establish your value system, it's three to five times more important than how smart you are or how technologically advanced your farm is. Yeah, if you start with the values, you, that may lead to you being able to share some of the, the great science behind it, That's but they're absolutely. not going to listen until you start with the shared value. So just in summary, our conversations tend to, when you talk to farmers and you hear them on, on the news or you hear, get a, read a quote in, the, in the, uh, news, your local paper, they're talking about yields and survival and they're talking about regulations and weather and crop prices and commodities. Um, at us, we will talk about CCAs and cooperative extension and ag research. But the moms and the consumers will want to know uh, they're not part of the ag population, so we need to shift our conversation or we have to lead off with our, our value statement that the things that they're concerned about are things that you're concerned about. So let's assume we've had a 12 to a two-week drought going on. So one way a farmer might respond, so when you, usually when weather events like this happen, the media is, is running out, right. wanting to talk to a farmer and saying, how's this affecting you? And so read these two answers. The 
first one, this weather is wiping out my production out. This last time our yield was 400 bushels, and now it's only 200 this year. If this weather continues, I will be ruined. I don't know if we can survive or I can survive. That other than saying this weather has tested our family's resolve, boom, the family's right there. I was telling my wife last night that we're producing half of what we did this time last year. I worry for my son's and daughter's future. I had hoped to leave this farm to them as my father did for me, but I don't know if this keeps up well. I, I, I just don't know. Do you see the difference in the two ways that you respond to that? One, you're, you're telling that listener, you're telling that reporter who's going to tell her audience or his audience that you're a family and you've got worries. So that's the difference between saying an economic response on one side and a, uh, a value space value-based response on the other. So they want to know who you are and what's your story and what your values are and do you share your values with them and never dismiss their concerns. Inside you may be rolling your eyes going, oh my God, here we go again. But you can't let that show up in a quote or on, on camera. Um, there are many reasons why uh, someone may come to you for an interview. They're responding to, a Nash, to weather news. There's been a rain, a flout, a, dr a drought, a hurricane. Maybe there's been something in national news about the farm bill, or I think back in 2015, we had an avian influenza in the Mid-Atlantic, not Mid-Atlantic, the Midwest. Mm -hmm. And all of the news outlets were coming to us saying, what, what happens if it happens here? And they wanted reaction. Uh, maybe a local profile a local interest. They may be doing a long piece on, on farming in general, and they may be wanting an extended interview with you. Um, it may be National Ag Week, and so they're going out trying to fill uh, content for that. Um, on, the, on the right hand, you hear, I got a call from, from somebody called State Plate and some guy named Taylor Hicks. Well, I don't watch American Idol, but apparently this guy won season five of mm -hmm. American Idol, and he's doing this TV show, and he wanted to um, talk to, about Delaware iconic food, and he wanted to talk to poultry. And my first instinct was, who is this? Is this going to be some Food Inc. type TV show, and it's going to slam agriculture? So I, I did some checking. And then, of course, we found out what was going on. So they came to us, and there's their film crew, and they were here all day long for what ended up being a minute and a half segment mm -hmm. that for our part of the half hour show. Um, but it was really cool and a great way to share. It was a great way to share. And so this is our extension agents talking. And but it's okay to to, to wonder: Is this going to be a hit piece? Are they going to be friendly or unfriendly? And there may be a um, there's, for instance, I think it was uh, Fair Oaks in Indiana. It was a dairy farm. And you may, some mm -hmm. of you have, who are on Facebook may have seen. And there's a link to that. You can click on it. I'm going to hold off on that now. If we have time, we'll go back to it. But there was footage taken uh, of some cruelty to dairy cows and maybe a total of a minute's worth of bad footage, but it was repeated over and over again. Um, by the time that this was found out, the owner of the farm actually fired the people. But it wasn't PETA, but it was a similar group to PETA. I can't think of the name off the hand. They were like, this is, this is what's going on. They actually were hidden. They were embedded in as employees. They filmed this going on. There's some, there's some counter attack now that some of these people who, who were filming were actually doing the cruelty so they could film cruelty. So it's a little unclear. But the owner of the farm got up right out in front of that video immediately and said, this, this cannot happen. This happened a year ago. In fact, the people have been fired, and here are the steps we're doing to make sure this never happens again. So when you, so, but this is the kind of thing where the press might go to other dairy farms and say, is this, how do you handle your business? And you've got to be able to say, I saw that. It was awful. That would not be tolerated on my farm. They need to be able to share that, that value piece right away. So if you get a call, hi, this is Michelle Walford from WBOC, and I'd like to uh, talk to you about XYZ issue. 
you can say, oh, my God, oh, hey, Michelle, that's, oh, oh, that would be great. Listen, you got me right in the middle of, I've got my hands stuck in some, some mud and some gook and my boots. Can I, can, can I call you back in 15 minutes? It's okay to say that. Now, you take that 15 minutes, get yourself tidied up, check out who I am, check out, the, maybe Google me, check out the pieces I've written. You'll get an idea real quick whether or not I'm an advocate, I'm a fair journalist, or whether I've got an agenda. So there's no reason that you have to write then and there, stop what you're doing, and answer that reporter's question. Say, listen, you give yourself at least 5, 10, 15 minutes, maybe even an hour. Say, when do you need this by, oh, well, this is going live tonight. Okay, well, look, let me get back with you in 10 minutes. So give yourself that cushion. And know that when they call, it's going to be right away. That's yeah. what they're, they always have those deadlines. So it is okay for, and if you reassure them that you're, you will call them back and that you're interested in interacting with them, that will put them at ease. Or you ask them to call you back, whichever, right. yeah. whichever Whatever way you want. So give you. yourself some time and say, okay, they're going to, and what will this be about, Michelle? And, and they'll say, well, I'm actually, I'm calling about how the droughts affected uh, your, your farm. Okay. All right, just give me 10 minutes and I'll get back with you. Then I, I can start thinking and preparing mm -hmm. um, my questions. So you do not want to be defensive. It's o absolutely okay for you to ask the purpose of the interview, where it will be shown, where it will go on air, or where it's going to go to print. Is it going to be written or broadcast, or it might be both? Ask the reporter's name slightly. You can Google that reporter and see what kind of pieces that they produce and write. Then, then here's what you have to do. So if they come out to you, as particularly if they meet you, have a fact sheet about your farm. Have that. You should have that anyway. You may print it off of what's on your website. But a reporter, anything you do to make a reporter's life easier, they will appreciate it. So the spellings of your name, you know, Brian, you can't just assume it's B-R-I-A-N. It could be B-R-Y-A-N or B-R-Y-E-N. I have two L's. Some people have one L in their name. You have to, they can get it wrong. So if you've given them that information, if you have a little fact sheet about when your farm was created, that you're a third, fourth, or fifth generation farmer, the number of acres that you till, the number of heads of cattle, or the number of poultry or houses you have, you can give them that all ahead of time in your website. They love that. They love that. And not only that, that helps you control the message. Because if you don't mention that you're a fourth generation farmer, it may never come up. It may never come up. But if you've given them that information, they may include that in the lead lead up to, to your piece. So today we're talking, or that it helps that reporter round out the story a little bit. And remember, a lot of the reporters, you know, are young <laughs> many times that, and they really don't have a true understanding possibly of your business. So it's so important. You're educating them along right. with their audience. We had a reporter one time came out and talked to 4-H leaders, and instead of calling them 4-H clubs, they called them 4-H groups. It's a minor thing, but if you can, like, give a fact sheet, a bullet sheet, here's some interesting things you might not know about our farm. See that barn over there that was built in 1837 and, mm -hmm. and things like that? You never know. They may look at that and go, oh, that could be another story, mm -hmm. and, and a friendly story at that. So have something ready to go that's just some interesting things about your about And if you mention that you're fourth generation, that shows the passion and love that your family yeah. has had and the care that you've provided because you're still here in the fourth generation. So that, that's important. And, and reporters are always looking for ways that they can get their material in print or on, on air. So they may be thinking, oh, I could do, I could come back here and do another story on the history and families, you know, so you're giving them some ideas. Tidy up your farm, particularly if they're going to be filming you at your location. Yeah. What people view is so important. And for many of us, again, this is probably going to be on the fly. It's something quick. But even if you are, haven't done this yet and you may get approached, it's always nice to have thought about this first because think about um, what that audience is going to see first. Yeah. Is it is it like it says position of the sun? Is there going to be a sunset or will it be a great you know view for people? 
you know, is it a mud hole? Granted, that's part of our business, but, you know, outside. But, but you, you need to know what's going to be viewed by the public. You definitely, this is the time to put away the trash cans. And if you've got paint, paint, empty paint cans outside or some some food bins or tubs, or it's time to clean that up. Um, you definitely, they come up, they pull up into your driveway. You could... You could stand in front of you. They might say, oh, I think, you know, this with the swing corn and the soybeans are blowing back and forth in the wind. That would look very bucolic. That's fine. Is there an angle that maybe includes your home in that background? Or to show that you're a family, just like yeah. the playground equipment, whatever yeah. connection you can give them that you would have in common with another family. Yeah, if, if, if you're looking at it from the outside in, they're talking about from production, and I come to Tracy's farm and I see her home and there's swing set in the background. What's that telling? It's there. She doesn't even have to say it. It's just that she's a family living on this farm. So think about the stage. If this is a stage and they may be only, you're only on there for 15 30 seconds, seconds yeah. 30 seconds, <laughs> but you, you want to be able to put the best foot forward. Um, farmers tend to talk about our operation, our industry. Use our family's farm. This family farm, we grow X, Y, Z. Um, you always want to put that usage in, in any of your answers if you possibly can. And then think about the frequently asked questions that you get from outsiders. And I'm sure you've, you've maybe you've gone to farmer's markets or, or you go to a family wedding and, and somebody else says, oh, what do you do? And you tell them you're a farm. What kind of questions do they ask you? Um, you need to have prepared some value statements about GMOs and pesticides and water quality and pollution. They don't know that all the nutrient management classes that you take so that you are a better steward of the environment and you're not polluting the way, not that we, but you know what I mean? People are thinking, oh, farmers are responsible for what's going on in the Chesapeake. Well, you know, so are golf courses, so are lawns, so are other things. They don't always hear that, that we're doing and taking really big corrective changing measures to, to be better stewards of the land. And we are, and we're making a huge difference in these areas. But have some of those kind of prepared. So, so, do you, so if someone sticks a microphone in your face and says, well, are these GMO crops? Have a way that you can say, well, actually this corn is, and the reason it's safe in my family, my daughter will go right down the road and grab it off the stalk and, and eat it. Raw, it's so good. Um, I would never feed uh, my family a product that I would not, and we've been growing this for 15, 20 years without any. Have something prepared so that when these questions come at you, you aren't um, um, you know, stumble. Yeah, and if you aren't as up on the topic, you could certainly provide a venue like Common Ground or other things like that where people could go get good research-based information. Yes. And so that's always it's, important. It's okay to say you don't know. Of course, you should know about the things that you're growing, but if, if people were to persist, that's when you want to be able to say, well, I'm really not the best expert on that, but um, I'll try to, you know, try to get that information. So in talking to the media, the viewers of the program are going to ask, what's in it for me? Like I said, um, these this crew was at our place of business all day long. Our spot, we, our um, Gordon and Emily there were on on the television screen for under a minute and a half all day long. So you want to be able to, when you respond with a question, Learn to say it in a concise way because they're not going to allow you to blabber on and justify everything. You've got to be able to say what you want to say in a, in a catchy way. Anecdotes are really popular. Uh, it's a good way of doing it. If, you, if you're going to say, like, oh, we use IM, IPM practices here, you've got to explain what IPM means mm -hmm. because they're not going to understand acronyms. It's important to translate that in in basic terms. So again, this is a uh, a very famous journalism triangle. You you don't start out with who you are and how smart you are and the degrees you have. You want to kind of 
talk about why it's important. Then you give the supporting details, but that value statement, which is your bottom line, should come first. The shrinking sound bite today, you gotta say what you say. If you if you watch and go home tonight and watch your local newscast and watch any piece that they do and watch how long that person that they're doing that piece on is on camera. Five or ten seconds. So um so this is where it's so important that even though you may not have thought about being interviewed, that if you did, what's behind you when they're filming you tells more to the public than you would ever dream of. Because they only are going to get to see you for five seconds. <laughs> and, and I would practice with members of your family um, so that you can answer it in a, in a concise yet value-based way. Um, this is really important. Um, you, you need to know how to tell it to a 12-year-old. And this is a journalism thing. Uh, when I went to journalism school, you write for, the, for a sixth grade education. That's just the plain, simple truth of it. Um, you will be talking to a reporter but that's not who your audience is going to be. Right. It's going to be the it's going to be the audience, the, the viewers or the readers behind it. Um, and again, avoid acronyms and use analogies if you can. Um, try to it, try to avoid things like production, agriculture, commercial. This operation. Talk about your family farm. Talk about new people hear nutrient management all the time. I'm taking classes to protect my local water system. It's better than saying I'm taking nutrient management classes. Mm -hmm. um, I want to keep crops healthy. Um, I'm, I'm into growing some fruits and vegetables, not especially crops. See, the, the kind of vernacular that we all talk to each other when we it's go within to, the industry. Within the industry. The general industry. public doesn't understand it. Yeah, you can't talk like we're at a Mid-Atlantic uh, Women in Ag Conference in February. We're all going to talk jargon to each other and lingo. You have to be mindful not to do that. Um, try to avoid these kinds of buzzwords. They they want to hear authenticity, and um, I don't know that anybody really would game changing and synergy. I've never really heard a farmer talk about like that. But these are things you just should avoid. Um, again, telling it to a 12 year old. If you're talking about eutrophication and estuaries and BT corn and fixing nitrogen, you're going to lose them. You're going to lose them. No-till should be, but say, well, we use no-till, which means that we're not tearing up the ground and we're replen We're trying to replenish yeah. the earth. So you've got to use words like that. Never, ever say no comment. If something is happening that's controversial in particular, never say no comment. Try to think of a response you may work for it. You may grow for an integrator, and they may have some tips on what they want you to say. So, in some cases, if you're under contract, there may be very specific things you <coughs> can or can't say. But to tell a reporter no comment, you've or, already set yourself up. Yeah, just say to go down that rabbit hole. <laughs> Gee, Michelle, I don't know that I'm the best person to talk about that. I read about that in the news, and I think it's very disturbing. But um, let me refer you to somebody else and, and kind of get out of it. But you don't want to say no comment. There are some blocking and bridging uh, techniques. And these are if they come at, come at you with a hostile question, that you could say something like, wow. And you could do this at a farmer's market. You could do this one-on-one -on -one with people. So um, I, I'm never going to eat that sweet corn. I, I know you put BT in it, and that's. That's GMO. You spray and that's, pesticides that, on uh, it. Uh-uh. No, no way. I'm not eating that stuff. And so, wow, your viewpoint is very interesting. How did you learn about that? And uh, so these are some of them. I'm not going to go through all of them. But um, the one thing you wanted to, to do in a blocking phrase is to kind of say, I see you're really interested in this topic. I see your passion. I see your concern about where how food is produced. Um, I'm interested in learning more. Tell me more wh wh why. Uh, oh, I said, oh, you, you have three children? Oh, I have two. How old are they? Oh, I have an eight-year-old, a nine-year-old, too. So you try to connect with them. Uh, when they tell you that they're concerned because they don't want to feed their children, you let them know you're a parent. Let them know that. Um, it's a way of connecting with them. So, And then you ask them after you've listened to them, may I share my story? 
And this is where you could you could say I completely understand where you're coming from, but we do this in our farm with this crop this way because, and then you explain yourself. I hope that makes One sense. of the best conversations I had was my son um, won a scholarship and we went to a dinner that they were, you know, having to present the award and met a young, a young lady there that um, never met before. And she asked what I did and, and I said, you know, we farm and I work in agriculture. And then we got into, and she asked me, well, do you do organic or non or She said, do you eat organic or non-organic? I said, I eat both. And then she didn't know what to say. And it wasn't that it was super controversial, but it's true. Yeah. And then she goes, well, why is that? And we had a wonderful conversation about that very topic. She got to ask questions, but it was at a level and, and it wasn't in any way controversial. You know, we were just having a nice conversation and I learned a lot from her, but she also learned a lot why I feel the way I do. And why do I eat both? <laughs> right. So. And this is where you might pull something like this is to, to listen to them and say, okay, but another thing to remember is this. And then you you make sure you get your point across that you want to tell them about. Or that's not my expertise. You're not a genetic scientist. But you can say, but what I can speak to is that I've been growing CT sweet corn, which is, by the way, a natural substance that, grow, that, that forms. It's, it is an organic substance. But we've been growing that corn for, gosh, 20 years now, and uh, it's so darn good I could pick it right off the, the stalk and, and eat it without cooking it. Um, my children, I would never, and I as a parent would never give my children something that I think would have any concern about. So this is, um, are all phrases of saying, well, here's how we see it, or that's an interesting point of view, but here's my take on the subject. So these are called bridging phrases. And then you get to the talking. You see politicians do this all the time. Um, and and they, they really practice it really well. <laughs> uh, be prepared to rehearse answers to, are organic foods better than non-organic? I won't eat foods grown with pesticides. Organic foods fight cancer better than non-organic. My grandfather was a farmer. Farmers is, farming is not like it is today, meaning worse. So you could talk right away. Well, farming actually is much better now because we're not spray. Before we used to just spray. Now we're now we're not. Now we're testing. Now we're looking at thresholds. Now we're looking at timing, and yeah. we're not putting the kind of pesticides down that we did back in the 50s when you think it was so great. I mean, there's been so many wonderful things. So farmers are beholding of the corporations. I watch Food Inc. and I'm shocked. Um, so forth and so on. So GMOs are killing bees causing autism, allergies, cancer. These are all topics that you need to kind of have an arsenal, have a, have a, a way of responding, and you don't want to be reading these. You want to be able to respond to them in your, in your own style, in your own way, but being able to, uh, you know, respond to them in, in a positive yeah. way. Other media tips. Uh, I don't know if anybody remembers when Sarah Palin was announced as John McCain's running mate back in, was it 2012? 20, no, 2008. Mm -hmm. 2008. 2008. But they went out to Alaska and they videotaped her. And meanwhile, there's this guy in the background. She's on this farm. There's this guy in the background grinding the head of a turkey in the turkey grinder. And it's all anybody talked about. So just, again, this goes... So people really have no clue what she actually said in that shot. No, they they just remember the turkey. The turkey. <laughs> it was turkey gate. So, you know, make sure your background, your, your farm is clean. Pay, a, pay attention to inside. They may be interviewing you at your desk. You have a bulletin board behind your desk. You, you don't want to have your doctor's appointment reminder card with the phone number on the bulletin board because someone's going to stop and stop action and blow it up and, and call that number. You make sure there's nothing personal. This is where you could put your awards with some family pictures in the background. So when they're visiting you and they're going to do a close, and most um, reporters for broadcasting will film you flying from the, uh, like a head and shoulder shot. So it'll be a pair, of, like you see here with Miss Palin, it's going to be a tight shot. So they can read what's on your wall in the background. So maybe it's not the time to be overtly political, take down the picture of, of a particular politician. 
you want to be neutral. You don't want to be offending anybody. Just be mindful of your background. And remember that when you're being interviewed, the camera and the mic is never off. So yep. don't assume that, like, say, okay, we're done shooting. Doesn't mean that everything's turned off. So you can't, you know, then decide, oh, well, you know, um, yeah, I didn't want to mention blah, 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 blah. Right. You just never know. And so it's always important to know you're on. <laughs> That's right. If you have a film crew coming to your, your place of business, they are going to want to shoot what's called B-roll. And this is file footage. Very few times, if they interview you for a minute, will you be on screen, your face and your, your shoulders, for that minute. And you, you, you'll start talking, and they cut away to what's known as B-roll, and this is footage of you. So they may do a pan of your farm. They may do a, a sign out front for five seconds. They may ask you, hey, could we get a couple shots of you? riding in your tractor or walking mm -hmm. through your cornfield, inspecting crops, um, tending your livestock. Um, mm -hmm. So be prepared that they'll ask you to do that. That's usually very good because it shows while you're talking, it's going to show you in, in action, show you at your place of business. So of course, you want it to look good. Um, so just be prepared that they may ask you for that. And you can say no to certain things if you, you know, can, can we fil film you, can we film inside the chicken house? You might not be allowed to do that. So you could say, no, actually, but I, I'll bring one chicken out and I'll hold it in my hand for you if, if that's okay. So you control the situation, but just be prepared that they may ask you. And again, if you watch your local news tonight, watch any segment, you're going to see how B-roll is used. And it's usually little 15, five, five to 10 second clips of background information. And the other thing is, is, remember, they're telling a story. So those five, 10 second cutaways, you're actually telling more in that short, in that five second clip by showing other pictures and other things like that. So think about it. They're telling a story. Could, what do you want in the story? Yeah. And then like what Tracy says here, you can may even offer, hey, would you like to see me? Um, riding off with a sprayer or a comma. It's harvest season now. So would you like to get a couple shots of uh, me on the combine? Oh, yeah. That, they may not be even thinking of that. So right. this is a way for you to say, oh, You make yeah. them look good, they're yeah. going to make you look good. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So you know your, your place of business better than anybody. Um, so you want to take advantage of that. What should you wear? Don't wear... Uh, vertical stripes. If th again, this is now going to be for for broadcast. Um, it doesn't matter what you wear if they're calling you on the phone. Okay, but avoid wearing vertical stripes because it just makes the camera go a little schizoid. You need to wear a collar because they are going to be miking you. And if you are wearing a rounded T-shirt or a V-neck T-shirt. Um, it, it's harder for the technician to mic you. They've got a pinch. It, it just doesn't look as good. So any kind of a polo shirt or any kind of a button-down shirt is best. A solid color and blue is better. White does not translate well on television, nor does black or red, because it messes with the camera's exposure. You look for a medium color, olive, a, a hunter green shirt, a navy blue shirt will work. Um, and if you go in and, and look up the whole Oprah situation yeah. that Michelle talked about, the person that they had come do the presentation was a female from, from, Cargill. Yeah. from Cargill, and she wore a purple shirt, not red because of the topic they were discussing, Blood and you know, and so, so you can be very mindful of, of what and, you're going to do. And very, it could be hotter than Hades. But it's not the not the day to wear your tank top. You should dress <laughs> conservatively. Um, if if you're a dirty farmer and that's part of your your ambiance, then you know you, you don't have to be. People know you're farming, but you we don't want to be. You want to, I don't know, just short, on the if you had to err, err on the side of caution on conservative dress, uh, being a little dirty is okay. But um, the other thing you don't want to do is wear brands that reflect a business. Um, you don't want, this is the time, not the time to be wearing a John Deere hat, um, a, a Syngenta shirt, 
Um, that may be where you buy your corn seed from, but it's not the time for you to be wearing that shirt. And, we, and you guys probably, most of farmers I know have a cachet of, of baseball caps that they can put on. You know, probably it's okay to put a, you know, Phillies hat on, but even then you're going to make all the Oriole fans mad. <laughs> but, but it is interesting because when I was on, recently on vacation with my husband, we chatted with a couple that we had just met just very yeah. casually and it came up, they asked what we did, and we told them, and it was interesting. They said, well, you really don't look like farmers. I just let that one go because I wasn't quite sure where that was going. Oh, you were supposed to be wearing overalls and chewing on a uh, Right, but, but isn't it interesting? Because you just never know how you're going to be taken, you yeah. know, and so that's always important. Even though this might be a little sound like a little overkill, <laughs> it may not be, you know. No. It, it's now, it's if, important. If you work, if your farm has logos like Princess Hopkins, down in Lewis, they they have a dairy. They have uh, yeah. Your your logo is your, your okay. fine. Absolutely, just don't wear someone else's because it looks like you're representing that that business. So um, that's pretty much what with that. And some, some final tips: don't make up any answers. Nothing is ever off the record. Be energetic, enthusiastic. Um, try not to ramble. It, the, I've seen the most poised people who've given the most wonderful speeches in front of people clam up the minute a camera is pointed at them. It can be you a little... You have to practice if you can. It's a little unnerving. Um, always think about your audience, not the reporter. The other thing I wanted to mention is the reporters will often ask leading questions. So during the mid Midwest avian influenza in 2015, we had reporters come here and want to talk to our poultry scientists. And I sat in on, one was an NBC affiliate out of Philadelphia, and he comes and he's talking to Dan Batista, our vet, veterinarian, and he says, so Dan, if Dr. Batista, if, if this were to happen in Delmarva, how many chickens would be executed? And he points the, cam the mic at Dan. The last word they use is the last word they hope you repeat back. Because we always remember, and they wanted Dan to say something like, well, you know, there are hundreds of thousands of birds would be executed. That's not what you want to say, and Dan knew enough not to repeat that word back. Sometimes they can lead or with, try to. Or yeah. try to lead you into an answer. Um, and that's what we have to be pre prepared for. So, Dan, I don't know what Dan's answer was, but it could be something like, well, we hope that we don't lose any birds. We are right. working They're really, all important to us. We try to all, keep them healthy. We're, yeah. we're working really hard to keep them all healthy. Our farmers, our growers here are, are one of the mo more proactive in the country, and that's why we've been successful here. So you, this is where you, you've heard the question, but you don't have to answer the question the way it was pitched to you. Right. Um, Words are so important. Many people. Um, I love your talk about your your story about the woodpile. Oh yeah, <laughs> so um, a true story. I work with master gardeners. Um, we were talking about wildlife habitat, and um, one of my volunteers lives in a in a community, and of course they have certain rules. Well, they had a very small brush pile, as I will call it, in the back of their yard for rabbits and other small and animals. Were complaining. And the, the homeowner association came around and said, you need to get rid of that. Well, they tried to explain it was for wildlife habitat. They were encouraging, you know, this on their property, blah, blah, blah. And they said, no, you need to get rid of that. And they continued to the talk. Country. And yeah. so finally the person from the homeowner association says, oh, you mean that's a thicket? And they said, yes, a thicket. Oh, well, then you can keep that. Okay, words <laughs> matter. People prefer poultry barns, even though we all in the industry call them poultry houses. Barn you know, elicits a completely different image in their head than a poultry house. Yeah. You know, my daughter um, met someone who was from New York City, and, and I think she said poultry house. Well, she said, you mean they live in your house with you? She's like, no. You know, so, I mean, it's, it's, you never know someone's background or, their, or what they're used to, and so those words are so important. So, when you're talking um, to others about just it. other things you can do, just keep in mind um, to, to pay attention to your websites because once you've gone in print or online, or I mean on air, people are going to go, I mean, I'm going to check out who Tracy Wooten is. And so your, your websites 
should have an About Us feature. Mm -hmm. This is where you want to put your family photos in there, history of your business, and vintage photographs. And always, every one of your websites, even your Facebook page, have a value statement. What is your philosophy? What is your um, feelings about animal welfare and the environment and how important that is to you? This is hugely important because people are going to be searching you out. Um, so with that, um, we'll open it up. We have a few minutes we left. Have eight for minutes left. We have, we have a few <laughs> minutes for questions. And um, so I will. Would love to hear your thoughts. I will unshare this and let me see here. I think I just messed up. That looks good. Um, thank you very much, Michelle and Tracy. We'll give the I'm curious if anybody listening in today has ever had a, a, a good or a negative experience with the media. I'd love to hear what that, that was like or misquoted or something like that. Not seeing any chats yet. Um, please use the chat pod or you can use the question and answer. If you want to put in any answer, any um, questions or, or comments from Michelle or Tracy. And I generally have a bit of a cringe when I do hear, you know, when the local newspaper calls or someone calls because you're, you always want to make sure that uh, your message is communicated well. Yeah, and you know, it's okay to ask. I know I've done uh, pay newspaper interviews before, and because um, sometimes the words that we use, or if the person isn't, that's not their area of expertise, and they may change a couple words that change the meaning. Yeah. And so it's okay, it doesn't always happen, but you can certainly ask, you yeah. know, if, if they'd be willing. The one thing you cannot expect them to do is they will never share the story prior to. Um, being print, going to print or going on. Right. They may call you back up and ask for a fact check uh, about something, um, but unless it's in-house, a reporter's never going to let you see it before it hits the air. That's just not done. They're going to say no. So you want to have it right. And you can and you can be honest and say, you know, uh, the only thing I'm worried about is I've I've been mis some of the things I've said have been misrepresented a few times and. Uh, Again, you may get a young person. This might be their first journalism job. Yes. Mm -hmm. and she may never have covered, or he may have never covered the ag beat. And so anything you can do, and that's why that piece of paper with some facts that you can hand to them, reporters are going to love you for that because it's just going to make their life so much easier. And one of the things that we've talked about in working with women in ag if you have an interest in maybe doing this, I mean, we could we can sit with you and practice and maybe give you some pointers if it's something you think you want to to um, be able to do, and um, you know, we're, that's what Extension is here for to help you out with that. I that's know, right. you know, we're happy to do that. And it doesn't look like we're, so I, I, uh, Shani didn't ask me to, but I'm going to do a plug for the 10-23-19. Yes, it's time for Twitter, really. That's me. I'm teaching that one. Um, and Twitter, uh, a lot of people, if, if there were a, a single platform that uh, farmers, well, I would almost change that to uh, Twitter and Instagram, but the ag, the ag sector, ag businesses, a lot of the discussions, a lot of the moms and reporters, they're all on Twitter. Twitter can get a bad rap. There's a lot of negative back and forth. It's, it's of course, <coughs> we all know that. But it's a really good platform for farmers to talk about what they do. They have things on there called Twitter chats. So um, if you want to know how to get started on Twitter and how it can be used to your advantage, um, that's what that topic is going to be on on, on October 23rd. Great. And, you know, along those lines, I know I'm very guilty of being the the agent that doesn't have time to do all that stuff. Michelle knows that we have we go back and forth on this all the time. But you know, having her in the same office is fantastic, and I've learned a lot from her. You know, that I use on a daily basis now. 
you know, as I interact. And so it's important. And so maybe you're not the person that does Twitter for your operation, but maybe you have another person who's good your at farm, it. Your farm, your family farm. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, your family farm. That's right. <laughs> See? See, she's got to correct me already. But no, I mean, it is important. And so maybe you're not the person, but maybe there's someone in in your family, you may have a grandchild or a daughter or a son. Or, or maybe it's an employee that is very good at that. And so, you know, we could talk with you about how that might work. Yeah. You don't have to be the key person because I know one of the things as you're, you're farming, I mean, you're doing so many different jobs and maybe that's not your love, but maybe there's somebody else that you could work with or partner with that could make that happen for you. But we do need to have people telling their stories. So even if it's the most ordinary thing that you do every day, someone else is going to find a very fascinating. Uh, I know Holly Porter from DPI has talked to poultry growers about that. What you do is interesting. And a lot of times in that particular industry, you're closed off because you, you're trying to be biosecure. So just but because of that, it's more secretive than it really needs to be. So people want to know that this is my day in my life. These are the muddy shoes. This is how my And I'll tell you, when, when we got, got into social media, I go, Michelle, people really want to know that? Seriously? <laughs> you know, and she goes, yes, Tracy, they do. And I'm like, oh. And so it makes you think a little differently about what you do on a daily yeah. basis. It humanizes you. And I think that that's what the anti-agriculture voices out there are always trying to to talk about our, our lack of ethics, our factory farm aspect of it. So anytime we can show wholesomeness of people who care and people who are, who are out there doing honest work, your value system, um, your wholesomeness, um, your day-to-day -day life in, in a photograph once in a while, it is extremely powerful. You know, it's interesting because when I got when I finally got on Facebook, um, we have sunflowers that someone planted and we rented them for dove hunting. Um, now I would never say that out on the on Facebook, but it was funny because as I'm looking through on some friends and people are sharing their children in this sunflower field, it was our property. <laughs> You know, and I'm like, oh, but I mean, people are like, oh, yeah, they look so great. You should stop by there and blah, 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 blah. So, I mean, sometimes it's the small gestures that, you know, and the small things that people care about. Now that you know that, use it to your advantage for direct marketing, you know, and I think a lot of you know that. But some of those small things do mean a lot to other people and, and will go a very long way in building that trust and value, shared value system. Um, there was a comment um, that came through that it, it's frustrating to be filmed for two hours for a two-minute segment, and you have no rights to see everything they film, that it would be, you know, really wishing that they would provide a copy because they could definitely go back and reference um, anything that you said. So, you know, taking things out of context yeah. and that type of thing. Um, that, and that's a discussion you could have. Um, there, there. As, a, as a somebody who does film editing, they've got to look for the money shot, the, 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 the money quote, the, the, what I call money, but the, the winning, that, that powerful statement that you make. They just don't have time. So they're going to film hoping they get that golden 30 seconds of film. And what do they do with all the rest of it? They may use it. It's true. Um, I don't know that they would use a direct, um, a direct quote. They might use the B-roll. Footage. Um, if they were doing, say, a piece on farming in general, and they might use some footage. It is, but that's. I'm not seeing too much evidence of that going bad, badly. Um, but it, it's also another plug for having thought about it and and being prepared. I guess. I mean, we can't avoid it completely. You can't let your guard down. Right. You and, have to understand that that may happen. But um, it's just remember that mic is always on, even if it's not, even if you don't think it's on and you're ready to speak. But this is why practice is so important. Um, and I also think that the other thing is a relationship. You can't always develop a quick relationship, but if it's somebody you've had a good experience with um, in the past, in the past, it might, you know, be helpful and they're more likely to share. But again, um, 
you can't always guard against that. I mean, I've had that happen with me in my career too, where you get misquoted or whatever, but um, more than, I've also had the positive where, you know, the positives have outweighed the negative. And I think the positives really go far for us as an industry in the ag industry when there are the, the negativity and the, the poor images of us out there. You want to be accessible and as transparent as you can, but you do want to be prepared. Yeah. And, and that's why if you can control the message, um, and a lot of it is with film crews and is just making sure that there's nothing ugly, un, in un, this is the time to paint the fence, this is the time to get away the rusty equipment, get it out of sight. Um, when I know companies coming in my house, man, I can clean like like nobody's business. <laughs> um, and that sometimes is what I need to do before I can clean I mean, to get get something in my house done. So, um, you know that that's a good impetus for for getting things ready to go. And and I'll tell you also just from people riding down the street, look over and see your farm on the left or the right side of the road. Does it look nice? Is it well kept? So all of that is is public image. And you use things to your advantage. I mean, sometimes people, if you've been a mainstay in the community for years and something happens, I take Willie Farms, for those of you who know their fire. People went above and beyond. They want to know, are you okay? What can we do to help you? We want you to come back as a business. So that says a lot about their image and the interaction they've had with the public. And, I, you know, I think they everybody was surprised that, wow, with Facebook, Boy, did that go viral! But yeah. you know, it was good for them, and they use that to their advantage. Yeah, they do. So, well, hopefully, this has been helpful. Um, don't be afraid of the press. We're not. We're not uh, monsters. And again, it, it's perfectly okay to to ask people, um, what, "What's your? Well, what are you going to do with this piece?" Um, and ask them, "Well, what will you do with this archival footage? If you use it for a different purposes, will I be notified?" And different news organizations may have different policies on that. I know at the University of Delaware, if I take a picture of Tracy on the job as, a, as an extension agent, and then later use her image on a piece about women in education, we don't do that. We don't, we have to, we will let her know, hey, we had this wonderful photograph, do you, do you mind? Because it's, we have rights to it, but we're using it for a completely different purpose than what we first took it for. So, so it's common courtesy it's to let me courtesy. know that that's how it's going to be used. But every organization is going to be a little bit different. And there's, when you open up, when you, when you decide you are going to be allowed to be interviewed and you are going to welcome them into your property, um, that's, that's the risk. And as I said, the risk risk benefit factor in to my way of thinking is probably going to be more on the benefit side. So if there's things you want to see at Women in Ag topics, you know, let us know because we'd love to be able to help you out with those. Great. And All thanks right. so much for letting us share today. Okay. Thank you so much.